All right. So I just thought, you know, as we kind of kick off this topic this morning, it would be really useful just to, to just show you this entire design process. And it would, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that one of the people who's been on a lot of these calls and a lot of these sessions is, is a colleague of mine at the university, um, Brittany Boomer, who is in charge of the Launchpad program at, at the Block School. And the reason I bring her up is she's really responsible for designing most of these slides. So it would be, it, it would be, re I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention uh, all the talented work that she brings and particularly the deck that you're going to see today is, is her hard work and creativity. So feel free to say good job, Brittany, in the, in the chat. It'll help pick up her self-esteem and make her feel good, but she's extremely talented and um, I wanted to make sure she, she knew how much I appreciate her. So here's the design thinking process, enough with the, with the happy talk. Uh, here's the design thinking process in its, in its totality. And I, I bring that, I just kind of show this to you because this is if IDEO or many of the other design thinking uh, entities that exist out there are gonna talk to you about a process, they're gonna talk to, to you about empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. But we're actually kind of changing that process a little bit. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, I'm not a big process person, right? So from the perspective of, it's not about the process, it's about how you think from my perspective. If we just wanted to teach you a process, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of processes out there, or if you just wanted to learn a process, you could open up a book. But, but the conversation we're having is more about how do we cultivate a problem solving mindset? And the value and utility to me about design thinking isn't just, the, isn't really the process itself. It's the mindset it creates. It's the user-centered mindset, the empathetic mindset. It's, and then if you have that mindset, you can kind of play around with the order of the process. And what we're gonna introduce with you today is that while yes, prototyping does come in after the solution set is developed in the ID8 form. But it could actually be, in my opinion, even more valuable if we introduce it at the beginning of the design process. And what I mean by that is that prototyping in its core, when we talk about what is a prototype, we're not actually talking about the first version of a, of a solution. That's not what a prototype was ever designed to be. A prototype is really supposed to be an artifact. It's designed to be something that you, the user, can interact with that will then get you closer to a solution. So think about it like this. Think about any time you've encountered someone who wants your opinion on something and they just ask you a general open-ended question. It's sometimes hard to come up with an answer if someone gives you this very broad, ambiguous question. Now, what if they put something in front of you and ask you to respond to it? All of a sudden, it's a lot easier to give meaningful feedback and answer. The thing they put in front of you is just a prototype. It's an artifact. It's something for you to interact with. And so when we talk and think about the, the way that prototypes can work, what we really are thinking about is putting some, something in front of the people we want feedback from that guides their, that, Actually, guide isn't the right word. That provides a, is a catalyst to the creative process, is a catalyst to them being able to give us feedback, right? So, for example, uh, and the example in here is a Scotiabank example, which I will actually put in box for you because it's actually a, an interesting way to think about it. Uh, it. It's an interesting example of prototyping. But so, for example, I'm going to let Monica chime in and we're going to, we're going to talk about how we've used prototyping a little bit in a process that you all should be familiar with. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, so we've talked a lot on this series about how there are a lot of unknowns right now, and we're trying to figure out what our work looks like, um, not only currently, but ongoing, as there are possible or probable changes that will probably take place for some time. And so one thing that you're familiar with is our navigation series, which is, as our colleague Cindy pointed out, a very recent active example of prototyping. So 
as a group at the Midwest Center, we wanted to actively explore what digital engagement with the nonprofit community looked like. And we wanted to get something out quickly, given the times and the desire to be present in our work and stay in that stay at home order situation. So we did sort of a pre work or pre prototyping. So Scott, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what pre prototyping looks like. Yeah, so as far as the process that, that we rolled out from the from the navigation series. Um, a lot of Monica and I would actually sit in the office with a whiteboard and write out like what the kind of process of a online engagement would be. Um, but and from a Midwest Center perspective, in our early meetings, it was it was really just a brainstorming process of here are ideas of how we could potentially engage the community from the perspective of of the of in in a time like what we're in right now, where where people can't get together and gather and. And how can we how can we think about opportunities for engagement that are consistent with the Midwest Center, but also able to be done in the current environment? Is that helpful? Yeah. So the yeah. So the point wasn't to have something perfect right at the start, but to test ideas and see what was interesting um, without investing too much and making it like this perfect final product right at the beginning and then adapt it from there. So there seems no better time than now to be uncertain together and talk about that. And that's kind of what propelled our idea forward. So we've adapted it every week and we'll continue to do so. Um, but it's really about getting everybody's reaction from it and seeing what's interesting to the participants and also the changing needs um, of the organizations that we, we talk to all the time and what's going on um, just in our, our community and in our culture. So it was really about trying something, um, being open to new iterations of it, observing and tracking reactions, and then just moving forward from there with new prototypes for future content. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a good example. When Monica and I were even talking about this session, she threw this out there as using it as our example during this time. And, and I really liked it because it's one that you all have been involved with, right? So you should have some familiarity with it. And, one of the things that we keep talking about internally is if you come back and look at the navigation series in two years, it won't look anything like what the very first navigation series event looked like. My assumption is it won't. If it did, we were extremely lucky. But that we view each and every one of these as an opportunity for you all to help us shape how we communicate with you. And so those questions we ask at the end and the feedback you all give in the chat is so critical to what we're doing. If we weren't getting feedback from you, this wouldn't be prototyping and it would be a really bad idea to be doing, candidly. Because the whole point here is to build a solution that is useful for you. It's not whether it's useful for us, it's whether it's useful for you. And the more you influence it, the more it begins to take form as its total end product. And so it wasn't, it was critically important from our end to get something out there and to not go through the process of trying to plan it perfectly because there's no way we would know what you wanted without you having input in the, in the process of doing it, right? And that's a different approach than the way we traditionally have done planning, where we try and plan everything out perfectly and then roll out, build the whole product. But part of the problem with the old approach for, for planning things out that way, and, and it's appropriate still in some circumstances, but one of the problems with that approach, if we don't get prototyping in early, is all of these processes, the empathize, the define, the ideate, the test, they take up time and resources. And as we get into building our program out, think about the programs you all built. They cost money to build programs. It costs money to build a fundraising strategy, right? I'm looking at Robin, so I brought, so I thought of fundraising. But think about a fundraising, an event that you've done, right? And think about how much time and money goes into putting that event together. How great would it be to begin to think about doing things in such a way that you can test pieces of an event in different ways from prototype perspective before you actually roll out a brand new way of doing things? A lot less resource investment more confidence that when you put the whole thing together that it's going to work. And here's the best part. 
you have something called receptivity, which is so critically important in innovation. There's a there's an article, uh, I forget who even wrote it now, but it talks about the five R's of scaling. And really, I like it as an innovation article because one of the big pieces, of, one of the big pieces of all innovation is how receptive is the environment going to be to your innovation, right? That's such a critical thing to think about and a perspective to think about. Um, I see some things coming up in, in box, uh, I mean, in the chat. So if I do miss something, I apologize. Uh, the, uh, I, I have a hard time monitoring both. So I know Monica and Mark and Cindy are also monitoring some of these things. So let's, let me give you a couple ways that you can do prototyping, right? There's not a lot of theory here, and these sessions aren't designed to be theory sessions. So we're really going to just get into different ways you can actually do prototyping that you can start testing this today if you wanted to. If you have an idea, you have a, if, if Robin has something in the fundraising space she wants to do, uh, Katie has something she wants to do with a client, there are different things that, approaches that you can, tools you can use immediately to start prototyping. Uh, I, Kyle's picture's up here too from the Royals and you know him and I have done a lot of these different prototypes with the UIA group, Darwin and his group. These are the other things that you can uh, that that he could he could try and do if he wanted to to test out new programming at the Urban Youth Academy. The key with prototyping, as it sits at the end, and let me go back just for a second, as it sits after the solution set, like the ideation is just the brainstorming for solutions, right? So whether you're doing prototyping before empathy or you're doing it after you've brainstormed solutions. Here's the key, the key thing I want everybody to think about is that when I'm prototyping, I'm building an artifact for an end user, right? Whoever the end user is. The end user could be a staff member if you're trying to redevelop a staff process. It could be a donor if you're trying to develop a fundraising program. It could be a program participant. But always remember, we're building it for the end user to interact with. Intentionality in what we do and the intentionality is always towards the end user. The thing I'm going to always stress is always, always do lo-fi prototypes. And by that, I mean the simpler, the better. And people will be like, well, I don't, I don't have the time or the resources or I'm not artistic enough to build a prototype. All you need is a pencil and a piece of paper to build a prototype. That's all you need to build a prototype. In fact, I have a, a worksheet that I'll upload for you. It wasn't important for today, but it's something you might find useful. It's a worksheet that just has like three iPhone or smartphone um, sketches on it that you can draw out the app buttons on, on it so that you can draw out a prototype of, a, of an app just with pen and paper. But it's kind of what they're doing on this slide, right? They just use the paper to draw out an iPad prototype. And when people interact with it, you can put the piece of paper in front of them, they can hit the button and uh, they can hit where they would hit on the screen and then you move to whatever the next piece of paper that would correspond with that place on the screen would be. But the idea here with low fidelity prototypes, they're cheap, they're easy. Um, and, you know, they do have a lack of realism, but you'd be surprised how, how the mind can go to these things. In some ways, the lack of realism is a good thing because you don't want someone attached during the prototype to something they already know. One of the easiest ways to prototype that you all may have thought about before or you've done before but you didn't think of it as prototyping is just storyboarding. Take the time, think about this for an event, right? So I'm, if I put this in the nonprofit context of an event, before your next big event, draw out the step, the way that someone would come into your event. Has anybody ever been to event, an event, a charity event, and they waited for, it felt like they were waiting for 20 minutes in a, in a registration line? Just saying, maybe. That can be solved through prototyping, right? How do people come in? How do you interact with them from the moment they come in? Right? Draw out, and these can be stick figures. You don't have to be an artist to do this. That's not the point. The point is sketching out visually the process by which someone would interact with you. So a storyboard can be an incredibly effective way to prototype. Flow charts, you've all probably done them. A flow chart is a form of prototype on process. It's another way to do a, a prototype process. And I keep, you'll notice that a strong emphasis on process. Well, the nonprofit sector is a heavy service industry, right? We all know that. 
So why wouldn't we be doing, so when you think about how do you prototype a service, one of the ways you prototype a service is you do a flow chart, you do a process map, you do a storyboard because it, you storyboard the service process. And once you storyboard it, you can then walk someone through it and see how they feel, right? So if I was running some sort of consulting service for an individual, let's say for people looking to get into college, I could, I could, I could, uh, do the flow of that process, sit down with prospective students and their families and walk them through it and, and ha get their reactions to the process to see how it would feel for them. That's the only point of the prototype. I've created an artifact for them to react to. And at the, fir the first artifact, by the way, could be, I call you, you just, we have a conversation, you decide. And then they can react to that and they can begin to fill in what are the other pieces they would need in that process and you're building your solution with them. Role play, great way to do prototyping. Don't even need pen and paper, don't even, and, and you do not need acting skills. And I promise you, you do not need drawing and acting skills because I've done these and I have neither, right? If I was drawing these, I, I already told you, Brittany has to do the slides. I have zero aesthetic. <laughs> so the, the idea with role playing is, Think about it, if, if I wanted to test out a new, uh, I, I want to go back to that fundraising example and I want to see how people register. Get your whole staff together, set up a registration desk and see how, have your staff register register for the session. See how they do. See what, what problems come up, right? Just role play the registration process. See what works, what doesn't work. We have an example coming up. Um, or we could have an example coming up, but this is what we did a lot with UIA. Kai and Kyle and, and Darwin will remember. Um, we ran field trips. This is one of my favorite. This is not really lo-fi, but it's relatively lo-fi. If you're good with PowerPoint, you can actually create an app in PowerPoint. Right, so it's the, the screen is showing you how, how you could do it. So you could have a tablet, you create the PowerPoint and with links in the PowerPoint, people can click on different things and see how they navigate through your app, so to speak. So you don't need to be an app developer to see how people move through and interact with your, with your uh, new app or your prototype. Again, the idea with the app prototype here isn't necessarily the aesthetic of it or anything like that. You're trying to understand how people are going to interact with your, with your product in such a way that you can improve the product. People, we do this all the time and we are familiar with this because all of you have these smartphones and you all have apps on them and they all have bug fixes and the reason there's bug fixes and there's new versions and updates you have to do with your app is that that the app creators are using you to prototype their their apps constantly the way you use it they're tracking the way you use that app and then they're putting out app updates to when it when it when it creates problems for you or when it breaks down or it doesn't work the way it was intended Uh, other types of, of, of prototyping, paper test, use Legos, clay. Uh, if you want, you can use Legos to build things out. You know, the first smartphone was actually a block of wood is what they used for the prototype. They actually walked around with a block of wood and they gave it to people and they said, how would you interact with it? A block of wood. They actually, and, and I, I, I'm taking this story from my friend Jason Gajkowski at MLYNR. But they actually, the first thing they used for the smartphone was a moleskin notepad. It didn't work because people already knew how to use a moleskin, uh, a moleskin notepad. So they, it didn't suffice as a good prototype material because all they did was use it as they would use a moleskin notepad. So they, they went back and they, they handed people a block of wood and, and they said, how would you interact with this? And that, in fact, the fact that it was a block of wood not related to a smartphone or, or any type of information device allowed them to, to use it as a very effective prototype. Monica, do you want to either talk about the Youth Academy or go deeper on our other example? Yeah, I just, I wanted to say to you, as you were mentioning the app as an example or the materials that you can use to create a prototype. So I think a lot of times people think about prototypes, just the word itself as being some like physical, tangible item. Um, and it doesn't have to be, as we talked about with the navigation series being a prototype or 
Scott has this picture up for Urban Youth Academy and talked a little bit about the field trips that they did and they created um, some programs around trying out these different activities and getting feedback, um, doing feedback sessions with the kids that participated. But I think like a lot of things in life, we tend to get too attached or too invested in perfection too early and it hinders us from moving forward. And so for me, like this series um, or a lot of the things that the Midwest Center does, a lot of it is just putting things out there and seeing what makes sense and what works for people and staying away from that, that perfection until you kind of get into it and you can see like what that's really going to mean to people. Um, but it doesn't have to be something tangible. So I think that's where people think of prototyping as like a designed item and it can be more of a designed idea. Yeah, it's a great point, Monica. And it's one of the things that I, I, I always, anyone who ever has ever worked with me or heard me talk knows that I, one of my favorite lines is, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And the idea is that, I mean, we, we all, there has to be a minimum standard of quality, right? We didn't just throw out the, uh, to Monica's point, we didn't just roll out the navigation series and say, we don't care how this works, right? I had a playlist for you guys. We had decent PowerPoint materials, things along those lines. But we didn't try and overthink every aspect of it to the point where we wouldn't have been able to get it out for like six weeks. In fact, one of the things we wanted to do was get it out earlier before maybe other things, candidly, took your attention so that we could hopefully begin to create an engagement with you. Uh, and so we can't, it's, it, it can be extremely detrimental to live in the perfect and not just be okay with the good when the good will get us further along. Um, when you said something else, Monica, it reminded me that the, there's a story about Dyson vacuums, the, you know, the cyclone vacuum, it, that it went through 5,000 prototypes. Now, not all of them were dramatic, but five, think about that, 5,000 versions of that before the final product was developed. That's a lot, and it uh, so patience. Patience is it, your patience is rewarded in this process, and all the while, as long as you're learning, you're in the progress. You're in the right process because you're learning more and more how to do these things. Did I cut you off there, Monica? Did you have anything else? No, but that made me think of something else too. Where um, Scott always gives me a hard time for being a little too like hippie and that sort of thing, and. Um, so I always think design thinking is something that really is a metaphor for life. So I think it's something that can be applied to just about everything. And if you think about a prototype in that sense, a prototype is really you and what you're doing and how you're going through your life and you're going back and you're making adjustments. And so it's not exclusive to designers. It's not exclusive to people who are experts at the process. It's available to everyone. Yeah, and that's actually the spirit that we want to kind of talk about in this series is the creating a different thought framework, a different paradigm with how you solve problems. And that's to me the highest utility of design thinking. It, again, it's not just about the steps, it's about what it, it does for you that you could in any time. So the next time you have a problem, do you immediately go to a pro building a prototype to help you solve that problem? Or do you, do you move into empathy quickly? That's what we're really searching for here or trying to cultivate. So one of the questions that you're logically going to have is which type of prototyping is best for, for your idea, your solution idea? And the answer is whatever one get, begins to get you information. So remember, the first thing is think about the audience you're interacting with, right? Uh, when we did the Urban Youth Academy example that Monica mentioned, when the, before it even opened, one of the first things we did was we set up field trips where kids from um, urban schools, I think 300 kids ended up coming through on these half day field trips. And we just would, we put together these really minimal programs, right? Like here's a hula hoop, throw a ball through a hula hoop and count how many times you got it through the hoop. So we're doing math and we're doing, and you know, what's your percentage? We're doing math and baseball at the same, baseball, softball at the same time, right? That was a good one because it worked for that age group. We wouldn't want something terribly sophisticated. We didn't need sophisticated. We didn't need some sort of, we didn't need a radar gun and, and things like that to do miles per hour or some, you know, to see how fast kids could throw. 
it's whatever is the right one for the audience and for what you're trying to get the audience information from the audience. And then what what are the questions? Something that you will always want to ask yourself as you do this prototype. What do you, you know, what are the questions you're answering with the prototype? One of the things we will talk about in this series is evaluation and not a traditional evaluation like some of you have been we've talked about it, like where you're evaluating a program, but just the, the overarching eva evaluation approach and how do you constantly use evaluation and evaluative mindset to get better, to learn. And so as you begin the prototyping process, you should have questions in place, right? You wanna know specific things from people. Maybe what what did the, what was good about it? So if we use the UIA example, like what, what games did you like? What what program? You know, what activities did you not like? And sometimes you don't even need to ask people. In that example, we just observed kids, and when if there was an activity that where kids were being distracted and they weren't paying attention, we viewed that as a failed activity, right? That was obviously one that wasn't engaging the kids well enough, so we needed to move on to something else. Uh, the the same thing is is true with any type when we're doing the navigation series. Believe it or not, we're watching, we have people, Mark, Cindy, Monica, Dave, Renz, myself, we're all doing different things during this series, trying to pay attention to are people feeling engaged? When are people dropping off? When are they not dropping off? We obviously haven't done a great job yet with the, we haven't done as good of a job as we want to do with the breakouts. So we keep trying to think and interact with people on the breakouts. How are they working? And we're actually going to try something today uh, that's a little different. Uh, so, you know, what are the questions we want to know from people? All right, so this is Q&A time. I've stopped screen sharing. This is an opportunity before we get into breakout time to do the, uh, for you all to kind of either weigh in. It can be Q&A, it can be um, statements. Uh, the floor is yours, so so please go before we uh, please uh, write something in the chat or unmute yourself and say something. Uh, you know, offer your two cents if you like. This is your opportunity to kind of interact with Monica and I. Okay, while we do that, I am also going to put up uh, an evaluation poll on the first half of the session here. Would you talk a, a little bit about having testers? Okay, and if you, by testers, you mean actually the individuals? Uh, James? Okay, perfect. Yes, so part of your prototype plan is, and part of the considerations of as you build a prototype is what capacity do you have to actually do the process, right? Engage in the prototyping process. So. For example, I just talked about with the navigation series, we have five people. We assigned part of the process of rolling it out was us getting together saying, Cindy, you're going to do this. Mark, you will do this. Uh, Monica is always the host. I don't know if you've noticed of these sessions. So she has certain responsibilities. Whoever's providing the content doesn't have any responsibilities typically other than providing the content. And the idea, James, from a tester perspective is, if it was just me doing these, for example, we would probably, I would probably disable the chat function, for example, and just rely on the evaluation piece. Or I would not have as much of a presentation to give and I would just try and do, I would be mo trying to monitor the chat as well. So it's actually really important as you go through the prototyping process to, to map out how you're going to do the prototyping and engaging. Um, when we, the other thing I would recommend is having a couple of questions ahead of time that you want people to, to respond to, right? In the form of the navigation series, we can use the poll like you're taking right now to give us feedback on what's working and what's not. Other questions. Um, in nonprofits, we're familiar with the concept of pilot programming. What would you say is the relationship between a prototype and a pilot? They could be the exact same thing. Great question. They could be the exact same thing. I think the, the difference between a prototype and a pilot though, uh, sometimes is that you can build your pilot out too much, right? So it's almost in how raw the pilot is 
versus whether they're inherently different things. I don't think they're different things. I think the some, but if you go through a process where you do, where you build out the entire pilot program and you invest a ton of time and resources in it, then it probably moves beyond prototype and into a more traditional uh, program development process. So the key with the prototype is that it's never designed, the initial version is never designed to be the final idea. So if, if that's how you're using pilot programs, then I, then I think they're the same thing. I would oh, add to that, I think that yeah. sometimes prototype lends, with, just the word itself, lends itself more just in our minds to staying away from that perfection and sometimes if something is already labeled a program, maybe that's just inherently people think of it as something that's more structured and more final. That may not be the case, um, but sometimes just words can have that sort of impact on your thought process. Great. Other thoughts? Questions, comments? Somebody? So we use when we're when we're going through these types of processes we use what i guess would be considered like a minimum viable product type model yeah and what we found is that um you know when it comes to to sort of adding a feature to something we're doing each time we add that it, it becomes kind of a prototype right because we're doing it in a live environment and we're asking people to use a particular feature of something. And I kind of wonder how that sort of minimum viable product thinking sort of goes into design thinking. Like what it, you're, you're, it's like changing the tires on a, on a moving car. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so it's a great, so Gene, good example. So the minimum viable product comes out of the lean start approach. It actually, to me, they, they, they're seamless. They go hand in hand. In my person, the design thinking and, and the lean start model go hand in hand. I would say the design thinking is the pre work that goes into the minimum viable product that you roll out, and that that the the minimum viable product is the outcome of a design process. Okay, so with that in mind, yes, a hundred percent. If you have a program that you're already running and you start adding things to it, you know, those, the new version of that is a prototype. And we often, we, we don't have the luxury. And this is why this approach, in my opinion, has you broad utility is that we don't have the ability to stop everything we're doing, stop serving people and start and to rebuild an entire program or intervention. So what is our alternative? Our alternative is to, build the plane while we're flying it a little bit, right? And so how do you build the plane while you're flying it without bringing the plane down? And the prototyping approach is one way to do that. Somebody else mentioned pilot, right? So that's the concept here, is that you add a little bit to it in, a, in, in such a way, in a thoughtful way that allows people to give feedback to it, which could change the, the entire trajectory of how that program works. But you aren't, you're learning forward. Right. So, but you're not going to just go and change the entire program because you have an idea for an enhancement of it and then have to go back and, and restart it the other way. You're just adding a little bit to it on the edges. So that's how I would say that those two things interact. Um, do you have experience working with multiple simultaneous prototypes built by different members of your team versus a team built prototype? Yes, uh, I do. What I would argue is that it's always great, especially if you have the luxury of time and it's a new entry to have multiple versions, multiple prototypes available for people to interact with. And then you will have a better idea of which is, which one will work and which one won't. Uh, and this is common in website changes, right? If you, any of you have done website enhancements and changes and wanted to test out a new website, you may do something called AB testing, which is you will let people interact with both versions of the website. So you, different people will interact with the version of the website with a different version of the website. And based on those interactions, you'll pick the web, the website version that, that is most effective. Um, did you want to say anything about AB testing, Monica? No, oh, that makes sense to me. Uh, so yes, I think 
versus a team built one. I th ideally, you still have a team involved because there is a we obviously we need to do something on teams, but there's a ton of reasons that teams work really well. Not the least of which is is diversity of perspective, right? So there's a utility there in in teams coming together. Uh, how would you select, suggest soliciting funding for design thinking prototypes? Uh, yeah, so funders do seem to want fully baked ideas. Uh, I think, you know, I'm working on it. I'm talking to funders every day. I'm talking to them. They like it when I say it. I need them to like it when you say it. Uh, I think part of it is in, in what we need them to understand and maybe the language we even use as we approach it. I don't know that we should tell them we're doing a prototype. I do think that if we ex explain the whole process that we're going through, if we explain prototyping as part of a larger process to more effectively serve people, we will have some uh, effectiveness with it. The other part that we didn't talk about today, but we will in this series, and Monica will go into great depth on this, Colette, is the metric side of this, right? So there are metrics. If I'm doing prototyping, I'm doing metrics. Like I'm, I'm collecting data and information so that I can know whether it's working or not. There's no reason to do a prototype if we're doing it in a vacuum and we're not planning to learn from it. Monica, anything on that? No, I think it will be really interesting as we look forward and some of the other topics we'll talk about. It'll get more into how you can back up those ideas and really support that process um, in how you explain it and explain what you're doing and what your aim is. Okay, so we are getting ready to go into breakouts. Now, what has happened in the past is people hop off and then someone ends up in a room with one other person or nobody else. And so what I, I'm gonna answer one more question. And if you do not wanna participate in the breakout time, this is a good time to leave. All no right? judgment, but don't leave anybody. No judgment. This is a judgment-free <laughs> zone. Judgment-free zone. There's no judgments here whatsoever. <laughs> but if you're staying, we're anticipating you're gonna stay and talk to your colleagues in the breakout session. And we'll let them go a little longer today. Um, so we'll let them go to about five after, uh, to 9.35 since we've, we've, we've been together as a group a little longer. Um, so stay, I'm gonna answer a question and Monica is gonna put you into breakout rooms. So don't open the rooms quite yet, Monica. Okay. And the question is which strategies to pre-prototype to break something really big into smaller parts? Great question. The strategy I would have is come up with a problem to solve. Get specific on what the problem is you're trying to solve with the whole, with the prototyping. This is all about problem solving. What is the problem you want to solve? If you have a, that will guide how you break up your, your pre-prototyping. The problem we wanted to solve with the navigation series is we wanted to make sure, you know, how do we connect with nonprofit executives, professionals, in a time where connection has been disrupted, right? That became the pre-prototyping opportunity for us to begin to think about. It was really that simple. If if it was if it was too broad of a problem to solve, who knows what we would have come up with? Too small, or if we didn't even have a problem, then we didn't really have anything to prototype. There has to be a problem at the base of everything you're doing from a prototyping perspective, from a design perspective, from a work perspective. If there's no problem to solve, there's no purpose. What is the problem to solve? And the good news is there's an abundance of problems to solve. So you won't run out of those. So always frame it within some sort of problem context. All right, Monica, I think we're ready. I finished answering that question. You guys have been great. Thank you so much for these questions. We're gonna break into groups. And as you break into groups, just talk. This is opportunity for you to have community time, network, no, no agenda. We want to try, we're prototyping a new way of doing breakouts. So let us know how it works.